Okay, welcome to Psych 235, Child Psychology. Today we're finishing up the chapter on uh, uh, early childhood uh, psychological development. Okay, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, parenting styles and things that are related to that, like punishment, gender development, um, <clears throat> mostly those things. So let's talk about these uh, uh, parenting styles. Actually, I think we left off over here. Social, first, we need to talk about socialization, okay? Socialization is basically the need to establish and maintain relationships that regulate behavior according to society's demands. That's what it says. Uh, socialization is basically how you learn about the rules, okay, uh, of society, what your parents expect from you, uh, what society expects from you. <clears throat> how you learn about those rules so you can regulate your behavior. And the most important part of socialization early on is parenting, which we're gonna get to in a moment. So parents do much to teach their children about rules, about limits, uh, about what to expect, how they're to behave themselves, all sorts of things, okay? The parent and the child determine the type of relationship between them. <clears throat> it's reciprocal. So, you know, the parent might be a certain kind of parent and, you know, you know uh, treat the child a certain way, Okay, but the child, by virtue of being an easy child, a difficult child, or somewhere in the middle, will also affect the kind of parenting he or she gets. Okay, so if you have a very difficult child, that can turn you into a very mean parent. If you have an easy child, that can turn you into a sort of easy parent. We'll talk about the parenting styles and what they're called and what they're like <clears throat> in a moment. But remember, the relationship is this reciprocal. Okay, you affect your children, but they also affect you. Okay, it's a relationship. The type of relationship between the parent and child can vary with culture. Yes, in some cultures, they prefer more that strict, mean kind of parenting, okay? And in other cultures, they prefer more the parenting that uh, is somewhere in the middle where it's, you know, <clears throat> it involves several things, okay? <clears throat> uh, I'll mention that uh, in a little bit if I uh, remember, but it varies by culture, even within the U.S., okay? Uh, White parents tend to be a bit different than black parents, than Latino parents, uh, than Asian parents. Believe it or not, Asian parents, Latino parents, and black parents tend to be a bit more harsh and mean. We can talk about why, okay? We'll talk about what kind of parenting style uh, they tend to use more often. Um, I'll try to mention that if I remember. I should remember the, to, uh, the cultural stuff. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about these parenting styles. Um, now, according to Diana Baumrin, so it's ba Baumrin's parenting styles, Diana Baumrin, okay? Uh, <clears throat> she's the one who uh, figured these out, right, by doing observations, okay? So um, she's basically the best kind of parenting, according to Diana Baumrin, are what we call authoritative parents. Authoritative, okay? These are parents that have high standards for their children, okay? So in other words, they expect the best for the children. They expect them to do well and achieve, okay? They expect them to get good grades, okay? They have firm rules for their, their kids. They do have rules, right? You need to go to school, right? You need to behave yourself, right? You need to clean up after yourself. They have rules, okay? Uh, but they adjust the rules with the child's age. As the child gets older, the child, uh, the rules change, okay? So for instance, young children need stricter rules than older children. Teenagers need a little bit more freedom, okay? Uh, to make some of their own choices. Little kids, not so much. They can easily get into trouble. Little kids, if you let them, they'll eat candy all day, okay, which is not good for them. So authoritative parents have rules. They have firm rules, but they will adjust them as the kids get older, okay? Because you need to basically loosen the reins a little bit as they get older <clears throat> and let your child decide more things as they become more capable and better able to understand what's actually going on in the world, okay? Then I gave you the example already with young children and let's say teenagers, okay? Teenagers should have very different rules than very young children. Uh, they explain the rules as well. They explain why certain behaviors are not allowed, okay? So they talk to their children, they explain things. Um, they enforce the rules. If the rules are broken, right? If they're not met, they do punish the children, okay? And punishment methods can vary, okay? We'll talk about something called the timeout, right? We'll talk about physical punishment, things like that. Um, 
they're not as likely to use physical punishment, but they do enforce the rules. And there, and there are various ways you can enforce the rules without beating up your kids, by the way. Beating up your children is not something that's encouraged. It's not the good form of parenting. It's not what these parents uh, uh, usually do, okay? But there's other ways to uh, punish your children. You can take things away. You can give them a timeout. There's, there's other things, okay? Uh, they encourage children to be independent. So they do encourage them to learn and figure things out, you know, and they're also high in nurturance and that's important, okay? They love their kids, they hug them, they kiss them, they tell them they love them, uh, they encourage them, they tell them they believe in them, all that is high in nurturance, okay? If you raise your children this way, according to Diana Pomeran, your children are likely to be self-assertive, so they're likely basically to, uh, you know, know what they're doing and stand up for themselves, right? They're likely to be independent, right? Because they learn, <clears throat> how to achieve and, uh, you know, and these parents encourage independence anyway. So, you know, they learn how to take care of themselves. And, and that also comes with the rules, right? They learn to follow rules, but you, and you have rules for them. Uh, and then you loosen the rules as they get a little bit older, allow them a little bit more choice, a little bit more freedom, responsibility, and that allows them to become independent as they get older. They're more likely to be friendly, right? Uh, because they had good parenting. And so they're likely to be friendly and get along with others. They're more cooperative, right, uh, with teachers, with others, right, because they had good relations with their parents. Likely to be competent, they were encouraged to achieve, right, high in need for achievement, that goes along with uh, competence, okay? And yes, I have a picture there, right, of a, you know, what's supposed to represent, I guess, a, uh, you know, loving family, I don't know, I just, uh, it's just a picture, okay? But, uh, you know, uh, you're, like I said, you're supposed to do all these things for your kids if you use the right kind of parenting. And I will tell you that this is, yes, the right kind of parenting according to uh, Western standards, okay? According to the U.S., you know, uh, Europe, Canada, right? Uh, the Australia, the white Western world, basically. But if you're from another culture, uh, you're more likely to use other kind of parenting styles, okay? And we'll talk about those in a moment. Okay, let's talk about the, the other parenting styles, um, which uh, from the perspective of, uh, you know, this culture is not considered the best parenting style. There's also the authoritarian parenting style, the very strict parenting style is what this is. Okay, so I have a picture of a colonel there who's very mean and expects certain things, right? That's the authoritarian parenting style, okay? They're very demanding. You do as I say, right? You don't question me. You don't question my authority. That's the authoritarian parenting style my way or the highway or you live under my roof you do as i say that kind of parenting okay they want the child to be obedient right they have very strict rules and they don't explain the rules if you ask why can't i stay up till 10 they'll say because i said so i'm the parent i make the rules you follow the rules i don't have to explain myself to you that kind of parent okay no consideration of the child's view okay uh, they don't care what the child says the child is expected to do what the parent says, and there's no compromise, there's no give and take, right? It's just, uh, you know, you do as you're told kind of parenting, okay? <clears throat> if you raise your children this way, according to Diana Baumrin, your children are likely to be conscientious. Yes, they do learn to follow the rules and be obedient, but they're also withdrawn, you know? They're not so trusting uh, because, um, well, you didn't, if you're an authoritarian parent, you treat your children as if you don't trust them you're mean and harsh to them, so you're not really showing them trust, okay? Um, and they, so you don't trust them, and you know, basically they don't trust you much. There's not a good relationship there, okay? Uh, girls tend to be shy when you're very mean and authoritarian with them, right? You cause them to withdraw, that's the way they deal with this difficulty. Um, doesn't mean uh, they can't also be hostile. Boys tend to be more hostile, right? Uh, and if you're very strict and mean to, to boys, uh, they're more likely to get upset and be hostile and challenge you, okay? Males have more testosterone, okay? Girls will tend to be more shy, but they can also get hostile. Uh, it's just on average, boys are a bit more hostile than girls. Girls are a bit more shy than boys when you use this kind of parenting. But it doesn't mean you can't have both, okay? Um, <clears throat> why, does, why is it that boys get hostile? This brings up something I forgot to mention. These parents are also very, uh, are, like I said, very strict. And these are the kind of parents that when you break the rules, they are likely to punish you severely. They're the ones who are likely to beat you, okay? Physically beat you, um, which by the way is considered child abuse nowadays, okay? That's not really something that is encouraged anymore. 
okay? But boys were likely to be more hostile when you beat them. They get mad, they can be aggressive and challenge you. Uh, and especially when they grow up to be teenagers, uh, they're really likely to challenge you, okay? Because you're being too mean, you're being too strict. These children also tend to feel, feel guilty and depressed. They blame themselves when things don't go well because these parents do tend to blame them, okay? They're mean, you know, they're very, uh, they're not very nice. They don't show them much love. So they're very mean to their kids. And when things go wrong, they blame their kids. They make the children feel guilty, make them feel depressed, right? Uh, children are more likely to blame themselves. It's not a good form of parenting. They're likely to rebel as adolescents and leave home before they're 20. Now, by the time they're 18, they're adults, okay? Um, but it's not uncommon that some of them will, might leave home when they're 16, basically. You know, they're teenagers and you're still treating them like children. You're being very mean, very strict. And, you know, and some of them will say, screw you, I am out of here. I'm not putting up with this crap anymore. And um, yeah, you can make your, uh, your, your kids basically uh, withdraw and even run away <clears throat> if you're too mean and too strict. Most of them won't, but those that do run away and those that do leave home and basically just say, screw this, I'm out of here, it's usually because they're getting this kind of parent and they can't take it anymore. They don't want to take it anymore. They're almost adults and they say, you know what, I don't have to put up with this anymore. Um, but yeah, these parents are very mean and strict. They don't care how old you are. You know, you might be 16 years old and they say, I don't care that you're 16 years old and you're going to be an adult in two years. Uh, I don't want you to be dating. No, you're not allowed to have boyfriends. Screw, screw you. You can't do that. Uh-uh. You're just going to get pregnant and you're going to cause me lots of trouble. No, you're not allowed to date. I don't care how old you are. Well, you live under my roof. You follow my rules. And, um, and by the way, uh, they are, um, you know, and some of them will even go as far as even when you're 18, 19, you know, even 20, if you're still living at home, they will basically still be very demanding on you and still basically, uh, maybe not even want you to date or go out or things like that. Some of them can be very mean and strict, okay? Even when you're already grown up. But keep in mind, when you're 18, you're technically an adult and they can't stop you, although they can try, okay? And the mean, really mean ones can, you know, can give you quite severe punishment if you don't follow their rules. Um, so, you know, you're more likely to leave if, they're being if you're being treated that way when you're an adult. Because you don't have to stay there when you're an adult. Um, <clears throat> I can tell you now uh, that uh, based on uh, some research that I've read, um, you know, if you are, let's say, have Asian parents, they're more likely to give you this kind of parenting. Asian parents tend to be more strict, okay? Uh, they are more strict. They, uh, they do have high expectations. They expect you to work hard and do really well, right? Uh, especially when it comes to education, right? They tend to be more authoritarian. If your parents are black, they also tend to be more authoritarian. Okay, uh, they're more likely to be really mean. Okay, uh, more likely to be uh, uh, to be strict. Okay, uh, and there's various reasons for that. One is the fact that black people have to deal with a lot of racism and discrimination. They're treated worse uh, uh, than you know people from you know than, than people of other race, um, and often they're frustrated, and they can take out that frustration on their children. <clears throat> Doesn't mean they're all like that. Um, but black parents tend to be a bit more mean, a bit more strict, uh, a bit more physical with their, uh, with their punishment. And so are Latinos, by the way. Latino uh, parents also be very strict, especially uh, with uh, females, okay? And they can also be very strict and demanding, especially if they're religious, by the way. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, can also uh, use a lot of, uh, not all of them, but they can also use a lot of physical punishment. I heard from my students that uh, in Mexico, uh, physically beating your kids is still considered okay. Now, that's not the way, it's not the, it's not the same way in all Latin American countries necessarily, but based on what my, some students have told me that in Mexico, beating up your kids, physically punish them is still considered okay. In this country, in the US, you physically beat your kids, you know, you can get into trouble and, you know, your kids can call the cops on you, you can have your kids taken away, they can get you into trouble. But these parents are mean and strict. Uh, that's the point. And uh, like I said, other cultures um, that are more collectivist, more traditional, they prefer this kind of parenting. They said that you have to be mean to the kids, you have to be strict with them, or they're just going to cause you lots of trouble. Okay. And I also want to point out that religious parents also tend to be very authoritarian. 
right? There's God, and then there's dad, right? And then there's mom, and then there's you, and you do as you're told. And the parent's authority comes from God. And you don't question what you're told. You don't question your beliefs, right? You don't question things. That's very authoritarian parenting. They're also very strict, okay? So that's the authoritarian parenting style. Uh, not considered the best parenting style, right? They are strict. They are mean. They do teach their children to follow the rules, however. Um, but they're not very nice to their kids. They're not very encouraging. They're not very loving, okay? They're mean, okay? And then we have the permissive parent parenting style, which also is not very good, okay? Uh, there's some problems with this. The permissive parent it has a very tolerant and accepting view of the child and the child's behavior. They're permissive. They basically let their kids do whatever they want, okay? Punishment is rare. They have very few rules of anything, okay? Children decide what to do with themselves and how to do it. They get to express both sexual and aggressive urges. Aggressive urges, you're more likely to see that early on. As they get older and enter puberty, they're going to have those sexual urges. And if you're this kind of parent, your child is more likely uh, you know, to start having sex earlier, okay? Because you let them do whatever they want. And they're going to take this attitude that it's my body and I can do whatever I want, right? Uh, even though they're underage, okay? Um, permissive parents basically let their children do whatever they want. Okay. Um, uh, now, there is a good thing about permissive parenting. They, they do love their children. Okay. They, lo they do love them. They are nurturing. But the problem is there's no discipline. Okay. There are no rules, if any, there's few rules, if any. So they let their kids do whatever they want. So this is called the permissive parenting style. Outcomes, right? If you raise your children this way, they're more likely to be impulsive. They'll do whatever the heck they want. They get mad. They're more likely to throw things and become aggressive. If they're, you know, if we're talking about older kids, you know, and they have uh, sexual desires, they're more likely to act on them. Low and self-reliant, they're more likely to be dependent, okay? Because this kind of parent is the kind of parent that basically, uh, you know, loves their kids, will do anything for their kids. So it doesn't really, you know, let them grow up, so to speak. Um, and they don't learn to follow the rules. They're more likely to be dependent on you for things, okay? Because they don't know how to take care of themselves. They do whatever the heck they want. Um, and that's not a good thing, okay? In the real world, there are rules. People have to, you know, follow those rules in order to obtain a job, to get an income, right? To get good grades, all those kinds of things. Law and self-control, like I said, right? Uh, there's very few rules, if any, so they don't learn to control themselves. Law and maturity, okay? They're kind of self-centered, more egocentric, uh, because you treat them as if, uh, you know, well, you don't really, you're not really mean to them. You're always nice to them. You let them do whatever they want. So you treat them like they're the ones in charge, uh, like they're, you know, everything that matters. And they don't know that in the real world, they can't always get their way. They don't, they're not necessarily the center of attention. So they tend to lack friends and, and kind of be immature, more likely to throw tantrums, throw a hissy fit, whatever you want to call it, uh, when they don't get their way. And of course, people who are more mature are turned off by those kind of things. More likely to be irresponsible, okay? Irresponsible with school, with employment, with bills. Why? Because they learn, they don't, they learn, you know, that there's very few rules, if, if any, they don't learn to follow the rules. Mommy and daddy are always there, always there to rescue them, to take care of them. So they don't become responsible. Okay. And you'll start seeing that. Okay. Uh, very quickly that they don't follow the rules and they don't think they should, they don't think the rules apply to them. Now, not all kids who are, have this, get this kind of parenting style will necessarily become this way, but there's a greater chance that this could happen. Okay. But I will tell you, uh, this reminds me that, um, yes, uh, parent that, uh, you know, children who are very easy to raise, who are good children are more likely to turn you into a permissive parent. If your child is very easy to raise, they're very good kids right? Then you take it easy on them, so to speak, because you don't really have to punish them. They're well behaved. So they might turn you into a permissive parent. So in that way, it doesn't necessarily mean the child is bad, but you know, they're good kids. So you can be a bit more permissive with them. <clears throat> doesn't mean you should, <clears throat> but what I'm saying is the child's parenting will also affect, the child's behavior will also affect your parenting. So if your child is very, it's just, uh, very difficult, they're likely to turn you into an authoritarian parent, a very strict parent, parenting to deal with them. If your child is a very easy and very well behaved, they're more likely to turn you into a permissive parenting, kind of easy kind of parent. 
And we also have the uh, neglectful, uninvolved parents. These are the worst, this is the worst kind of parenting. Neglectful parents, uninvolved parents. These are the parents basically who are physically, psychologically, emotionally not there, one way or the other. Okay, so these are parents that are indifferent toward their children and unaware of what is going on in their children's lives. Sometimes these are the, we're talking about parents who don't care about their kids and they don't care what they're doing, okay? And they just don't care. Some of them, it's because they're not really capable of caring. They're locked up, they're in jail, for instance, or they're working too many jobs and they're never home. Or it could be that the parents, for instance, are uh, drug addicts, alcohol, severe alcoholics, and they're always drunk, stoned, whatever you want to call it. And uh, mentally, they're not there. So these parents are basically unaware, uninvolved for one reason or another. It's like they don't care about their kids. Some of them don't care about their kids. A lot of them do, but can't take good care of their kids because they have problems with drugs, problems you know, uh, with incarceration, or it could be they're just working too hard and they're never home for their kids, okay? This is not good for children. So children basically end up raising themselves. Children of uninvolved parents tend to be immature, okay? Uh, they basically, you know, no one's there to tell them, uh, you know, to follow rules, to be a certain way. So they tend to do whatever they want and, uh, and don't really act responsibly. They tend to be immature. They also tend to be sad and lonely because no one's there to really take care of them. And they're more at risk for abuse, by the way, you know, because they're on their own and others could easily take advantage of them. No one's watching them and they are children. Okay, they may have social and cognitive problems, you know, social problems. Um, these are the ones that are more likely to turn into delinquents they, when they become teenagers and criminals when they become adults. No one was watching them. No one was taking care of them. They kind of, it's like they grew up on the streets, so to speak. Okay, and some of them really do literally grow up on the streets. Some of them do have a home, an apartment or a home or something like that, but no one's watching them. So they can do whatever they want and they encounter bad people, bad role models, and they tend to learn some very bad things. So they can become delinquents and gang members and things like that. Especially by the way, if the father is missing, okay? More likely to have cognitive problems, uh, you know, problems with learning, you know, uh, just problems doing well in general. A lot of them have, you know, can also have, uh, you know, uh, like learning disabilities or just uh, that aren't corrected because no one's watching after them. No one's taking care of them. Okay, a lot of your delinquents, like I said, gangsters, criminals come from this kind of parenting. Okay, no one cared about them, so to speak. No one was taking care of them. They, have a very, they had a very rough childhood and they basically had to raise themselves. Some children, despite getting this kind of parenting, still become, you know, uh, good kids, responsible adults. Some of them because they're forced to grow up more quickly because they, they're, they have to behave like adults early on. But there's others who will basically, because nobody's watching, no one's caring for them, instead they will get into a lot of trouble and don't learn about proper rules and being responsible and things like that. These are things that you need parents for. They need guidance, right? Kids need guidance, right? They need to learn to follow rules. They need love, they need encouragement. These don't get any of that, okay? So this is the worst kind of parenting. Um, so um, yeah, those are the parenting styles. And here's a chart uh, to, help you compare them. So this uh, mentions, uh, so you have at the top the labels there. So we have the style, whether it's authoritative, uh, authoritative, authoritarian, uh, permissive. The uninvolved is not listed there, but you can kind of, we can kind of guess at it. And then there's, uh, okay, so there's the style, right? The name, the type of parenting, and then how much warmth is there? How much discipline? What are the expectations? How much communication? So authoritative parenting is considered the best kind of parenting, right? Uh, so these parents, parents are high in warmth. They love their children. They encourage them. Okay. They tell them they love them. They hug and kiss them, right? Children know they're loved. With discipline, they're moderate with discussion. They're somewhere in the middle as far as how strict they are. They're not easy parents. They're not extremely strict either. They're in the middle and they do explain the rules and why punishment uh, is necessary, right? That's discussion. Expectations are high. They love their children. They encourage them. They expect them to do well. They tell them to you know, get good grades, to work hard and all that stuff, right? Communication is high. They talk to their kids, kids talk to them, they're high in trust, okay? Authoritarian parents are different. Uh, they're very low in warmth, okay? They don't really tell their children they love them much or hug them, kiss them or show them much love. 
okay? Because these are the parents that are kind of mean and strict. So they don't really show you much love, okay? Um, discipline, strict and physical. Very strict, okay? Very tough rules, okay? And physical. These are the ones who are likely to beat you, which is considered child abuse, by the way. Not considered an acceptable parenting style here in the US anymore, but still very popular in lots of other countries to be authoritarian. Okay, expectations, uh, moderate. They don't really expect the best from their kids. They don't really expect their children to be the worst either. Their ex children are expected to follow the rules, okay? Uh, communication uh, is different um, than authoritative parents. Uh, it's high from parent to child. I mean, the parent has, a lot, of, uh, has a, lot of, a lot to say to the child. I want you to do this and this. You don't question my rules, blah, 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 right? But the, uh, it's low from the child to the parent. In other words, the child is not allowed to ask questions, not allowed to ask why, right? You shut up and do as you're told, that kind of thing. Communication is low from the child to the parent. Permissive parents are different. Permissive parents, warmth is high. They do love their children and show them lots of affection. They love their children, okay? Um, discipline is rare, okay? They don't really have much rules for their kids. They don't really punish them, okay? Expectations are kind of low. Permissive parents let their children do whatever they want and they don't really have high expectations. You know, if children don't feel like going to school, they'll tell them it's okay, you can stay home, you know? You don't want to go to college, that's fine. Kind of uh, low expectations, okay? Communication is low from the parent to the child. The, the parent doesn't really say much to the child, okay? But communication is high from the child to the parent, from the child to the parent. So it's the child making the demands, in other words. The child is saying, I want this and you're unfair and I should be allowed to do whatever I want, right? That's the child talking back. And these permissive parents allow that but they don't really respond back. They let their children rule over them, so to speak. They let their children do whatever they want. Uh, now, the uh, neglectful, uninvolved parenting style is not there, but we can guess the warmth would be low. They're not there physically, mentally, or emotionally, okay? Um, discipline would also be low. They're not there, so they can't punish them. Expectations are low. No one's taking care of these children. Nothing is expected of them. Communication is low. They're not there. Okay, so this chart tells you a lot about the parenting styles. And I know that was interesting. Let's, uh, let's keep going. We're gonna move a little bit faster now because I, I sp spent too much time on that, okay? And um, well, we need to move on, okay? Um, punishment, what about punishment? Like I said, uh, punishment uh, can vary by parenting style. The strict authoritarian parents are the ones that are, are likely to use physical punishment, but there are other punishment methods. Okay, like for instance, Japanese parents tend to use more reasoning, more empathy, and expression of disappointment to control their children. They really have a uh, very uh, uh, kind of useful way, uh, a very, um, how should I say, um, they have a way of looking at their children where you show them that they're disappointed, okay? Um, and basically, and, and their children are very affected by that. It's, it's like a type of punishment. I'm disappointed in you. Or, the, you know, they're more likely to be, use reasoning, empathy, right? Connect with the children. They're more of a collectivist culture. More than North, North Americans, by the way. North Americans are less likely to use reasoning and empathy, right? More likely to, uh, you know, to use physical punishment, okay? Um, North American parents allow their children to express more emotional expressions, more anger than Japanese. Uh, here in the U.S., I mean, it's the land of the free, so to speak. If you don't like something, you're, you speak up. If you're angry, you're allowed to express your anger, even publicly. And, uh, you know, that's a freedom that we have here. And children learn that very early on. And parents tell their children, I mean, teach their children this stuff, you know. So children are, express their anger much sooner. Uh, and it's okay for children to express their anger more than the Japanese. Japanese is more of a collectivist culture more of a culture like you do what you're told, you obey your parents, right? Uh, you're, it's, 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 the, it's the collective group, the group matters more than the individual. So they're less likely to encourage, you know, expression of anger or, you know, that kind of stuff. It's just not as acceptable. But here in the US, you can get as upset as you want, uh, you know, and uh, you learn that pretty early on. And you're, it's okay for you to show that you're angry, okay? You can see, right, on the news, on TV, how angry people get, okay, all the time, and how divided we are as a country, because we're allowed to talk about 
you know, stuff that upsets us and say that we don't like that or we the hell with this. We learned that pretty early on as North Americans, okay? Um, in an experiment designed to elicit distress and conflict, experiment showed that American kids behave more aggressively than Japanese kids. It, it kind of goes along with freedom, right? You talk, you know, you, you're angry, you get to express that and maybe even show it. And you'll see in experiments that, yeah, they'll behave more aggressively than Japanese kids that are more likely to, you know, kind of do as they're told, so to speak, more likely to follow the group, uh, more likely to kind of hold in their frustration, their anger, they're told, you know, that the group matters more than you individually, that kind of stuff. Uh, it, it's a different culture, okay? It's more collectivist. Here, it's the land of the free. It's me, me, me. You're angry, you can say it, you can express it. You don't like something, well, you can say it, right? And if you, uh, you know, you know, want to be aggressive, a lot of people, you know, are likely to do that in some way or another. Uh, hopefully, you're not physically aggressive because you can get into trouble, but you can be verbally aggressive if you want and talk a lot of crap. Okay, that's the U.S. Okay, we're that's a freedom we have here. We have freedom of speech. Um, other punishment methods. Okay, so there's a uh, timeout. You can also use a timeout. With a timeout, uh, everyone pretty much knows about this now. But with a timeout, uh, children basically stop all their activity. Right. So a child is acting up. You say, "All right, stop what you're doing. Right. Come here. Right." And uh, you, they stop all their activity, and you put them in the corner or you put them in the room all by themselves uh, for a few minutes. That's a timeout. You take them away from the situation, basically. Okay. Um, temperament, age, all that should be considered. Okay. As far as age, I will tell you that, um, you know, uh, what's considered appropriate is basically one minute of timeout for every age, for every, for every year of age for the child. So if you're talking about a one year old, one minute is sufficient. Uh, a two year old, two minutes, right? For a four year old, you can give them a timeout for four minutes. Okay. Um, but temperament also matters, okay? Temperament matters. Uh, they are, there are children, for instance, who are uh, kind of loners and withdrawn, and for them, a timeout isn't really a punishment. They welcome that. The, yeah, so the defiant loner may welcome the timeout. For them, it's more of a reward, okay? For a child that is very social, seeks a lot of social approval, a timeout for them is very severe. They see it as very severe punishment, and they will cry and scream, and you'll know they don't like it. Okay, very young children are distressed by even a one minute timeout. Like I said, you know, uh, one, one minute for every year of age of, of the child, right? One minute may seem like very little, but for a one year old, uh, that is distressing, okay? For them to be alone, taken away from the situation, okay? Uh, a timeout should be appropriate, of course, for the child's age. And I told you it should vary by, based on, uh, you know, the child's age, okay? One minute per year of age is considered appropriate. Although keep in mind that teenagers, right? You have a 13 year old, 13 minute timeout might not seem like much, but you know, if, uh, if it's a real timeout where they're, you know, you send them to their room, they're not playing with anything there, no video games, no TV in the room, no books, no nothing. You take them away from everything, right? That might be more appropriate, but some of them will say, oh, 10 minutes, big deal, or, or 15 minutes for a 15 year old. You know, they may uh, say, uh, you know, that, it's nothing for them. These kids are older, right? There's other ways to punish them as well. Timeout is more useful for younger children. Other punishment methods, uh, you can uh, take away privileges, withdraw the privilege, take away their toys, right? Take away TV. Uh, your teenagers, right? Uh, they have things you can take away. Go ahead, take away their phones, their, their tablets, okay? Uh, the time to be with their friends, socializing, all that stuff. Oh, trust me, they will really... Uh, uh, miss those things and they will get upset that you take away those things, okay? They love those things that allow them to connect with their friends, allow them to use their devices. You can take that away. They don't have to have that stuff, okay? Um, even if they don't have the devices, right? You can take away TV time, play time, whatever it is. Uh, with younger children, it works as well. Children have a lot of things nowadays. Even the younger children now have ta tablets, right? They have TVs, they have toys. You can take all that stuff away. Say, all right, you're acting up, take away all this stuff. I took away my daughter's, uh, uh, she has an iPad, right? She's, uh, you know, um, she's nine years old. And trust me, when she loses that iPad, oh, she starts crying and screaming. It's like, it's like the most horrible thing in the world for her. She really loves that thing, okay? But she knows when she loses that, she knows that she did something wrong and that she's being punished. Withdrawal of affection, give them a mean look, right? 
uh, express disappointment, you know, those children that you're more connected with that are more social, that's more likely to work on them. The ones that don't like you or the ones that are kind of more withdrawn or, you know, that like to be on their own, that won't work as well for them. Talking explanations, yes, you should explain to children why you're punishing them, right? That's effective, but it depends on the child's temperament. You know, uh, for some children, they don't care. They're not social, they're loners, and that won't really be too effective on them. They don't care what you have to say much anyway, okay? Uh, spanking, physical punishment. Um, isn't there more? Uh, no, I guess that's all there is there. Spanking and physical punishment uh, is no longer considered appropriate. It doesn't say there, but uh, no longer considered appropriate, okay? Uh, you're still allowed to spank your children, by the way. You can still spank them, but you have to do it in a certain way. It has to be basically um, open palm, okay? Uh, over their clothes, okay? You're not allowed to leave bruises or marks. So no, no, take down your pants and your underwear, and then you spank them really hard and you leave... Uh, marks, red marks, and bruises, that is not allowed. Physical punishment, slapping your kids, punching them, kicking them, whipping them with a belt, all that is considered child abuse. Spanking is still allowed, but frowned upon, by the way. Physical punishment in general is considered child abuse. Even spanking, although you can still get away with spanking, okay, if you do it the right way. But it's still not considered a good form of punishment. Okay, you're not considered a good parent if you spank your kids nowadays. And if you're even worse, if you're beating them up, okay, in some other way. And by the way, you can get into a lot of trouble. Your kid go to school with black eyes with bruises, right? They'll call the authorities on you and you can have your kids taken away. Uh, well, here's more information about spanking and physical punishment. So it wasn't in the previous slide because the information is here. I just wanted to bring it up first, okay, and in child illicit discussion. And here's the information about it. Spanking and physical punishment only temporarily increases obedience. So yes, your children will be obedient because you know, you're know you punishing them, you're spanking them, you physically punish them, but it's only temporary. You actually piss them off. And then when you're not looking, they're not gonna obey you. They're gonna be pissed off at you. As a matter of fact, they're more, and they're more likely to, to basically say, screw you and uh, I'm gonna do whatever I want when you're not looking. I'm gonna obey while you're looking, but not when you're not looking. Uh, it can also increase aggressive behavior, antisocial behavior, and resentment. You make your children angry and upset. You're more likely to make them aggressive, okay? Uh, antisocial, right? They're more likely you know, not to get along with others and resent you for beating them, okay? And physically punishing them. By the way, bullies, actually usually have problems at home. You know those, those bullies that are very aggressive and they tend to beat up other kids and take it on other kids? Uh, usually they have problems at home and they get physical punishment at home and they're not treated very well at home as well, okay? Um, some of them, not all of them. Some of them are just, are just bad, okay? They're just difficult and they, uh, they tend to use their power, their authority on other uh, kids because they're bigger and stronger. Okay, so you can, uh, yeah, uh, by physically punishing your kids, you're actually teaching them that it's okay to beat up others. It's okay to use physical punishment to basically exert your way onto others, right? To make people do what you want physically. Many children who are spanked do not become violent adults. Not all of them, of course. Many of them won't. There's other factors like poverty, temperament, you know, maltreatment, all those things are stronger influences. But spanking, physical punishment makes it more likely. Okay, because children are being taught lessons about violence, lessons about aggressive behavior. You're teaching your kids that it's okay to physically hurt others, and you should not be teaching them that. Harsh physical punishment can produce an angry, disobedient child. You beat them really hard, spank them really hard, punch them, kick them, kick them. There's parents who do that. Whip them with a belt, like a lot of Latinos do. Hit them with a shoe, right, with la chancla, all that stuff, right? A sandal, right, whatever. Uh, that is uh, very mean, very harsh, and it will make kids angry and likely to make them disobedient. And when they become teenagers, they're more likely to say, F you, screw you, I'm going to do whatever the hell I want, and they'll drive you nuts and be a very difficult child. And even worse, some of them will basically leave home and say, I'm not taking this anymore, I am out of here. But others will stick around, and they'll just be very difficult children. They'll be very uh, disobedient teenagers because they don't like you anymore. They don't like you, you've made them angry, you've uh, basically been violent with them, and they resent you, they're angry at you, okay? 
Doesn't mean you can't fix your relationship with your children, your teenagers. You can, but physically punishing them isn't going to make it any better. Okay, it's going to make it worse. Uh, let's talk about other stuff. Uh, not as interesting. Uh, this next up, so we can move a little bit faster. So make sure we get through this. Um, so now, let's, so we're talking about psychological development. Let's talk about the self. How do uh, children uh, describe themselves? Self description. Okay. Um, so preschoolers tend to describe themselves in more concrete ways that reflects Piaget's uh, theory of, uh, you know, of, of development uh, where he's, you know, that when children are in the concrete operational stage. So they might say things like, I go to school, I like it, I play with my brother a lot, I have dark brown hair, I like to talk, right? They describe themselves in physical ways. I play with these things, I look this way, I like this, right? Um, that's preschoolers. A six-year-old describes themselves a little bit differently. A six-year-old will say something like, I'm the youngest in my family. I'm happy most of the time. I like riding my bike. I like almost everybody and have lots of friends. When I grow up, I want to be a librarian, et cetera. Okay, a little bit more detailed, a little bit more social, right? Uh, reflects their age. Older children use more abstract ideas. They said, you know, they'll use words like friendship and happiness. They'll say that they're nice, that they're kind, right? That they like you know, that they like to, you know, help others. And, you know, it's, so they start using things that are more kind of um, more abstract. In other words, they're more to do with ideas, less concrete. What does this reflect? This reflects Piaget's theory of development. When children are younger, they think in more concrete ways, more physical ways. As they get older, uh, their way of thinking becomes more abstract, more mental. It's more about ideas. Um, more about psychological development. Let's talk about gender development. Um, so just some terms here. Uh, you should know that sex refers to, uh, you know, whether a child is male or female, that's the child's sex. It's or often called biological sex, right? You can have children, by the way, that can be intersex, that can be in the middle, okay? It's not always strictly male or female. There are some that can be in the middle and you may not know it, okay? Um, that's biological sex. Gender and other gender is different. Gender is more psychological. Gender has to do with phys, with aspects of being male or female. Okay, whether they consider themselves more male, for instance, more assertive, more aggressive, or more feminine, where they're more nurturing, uh, prefer you know more communication. Right. Uh, this refers to gender stereotypes about what males are like and what females are like. And yes, you could have a boy that is basically acts more feminine even though he's male or you could have a girl that acts more masculine even though she's female okay because gender is a little bit different gender it has to do with whether they act more masculine or feminine according to what our culture defines as masculine or feminine and you can see here uh with the way children play they express these gender roles you see that little girl right uh pretending to play mommy okay more typical of girls than boys with boys and we're like them see we play with with trucks and animals and things like that. Uh, costumes, Halloween costumes, reflect this as well. Girls will dress into more things that are more feminine, you know, a little angel, a princess, that kind of stuff. I know this one's dressed as a little devil, um, but more usually more feminine stuff, boys, cowboy, alien, you know, uh, an animal or something like that, a zombie, right? More aggressive, dangerous, you know, kind of, uh, adventurous kind of stuff, okay? Um, so you see that in the choices they make for costumes and what they want, but you know, why does this happen, okay? We'll talk about that soon. Why do we develop these ideas about what's feminine and what's masculine? We'll talk about that soon. Um, becoming boys and girls, uh, by age two, children know whether they are boys or girls and they apply gender labels consistently. So by age two, your child knows, yeah, I'm a boy, I'm a girl, and they refer to themselves with the right label. Okay, um, boy, girl, he, she, that kind of stuff. Uh, by age four, children are convinced uh, that certain toys, such as dolls and trucks, are appropriate for one gender but not the other. They start learning this, these stereotypical things that boys play with trucks, you know, right? And girls play with dolls and they play mommy. Boys don't play that stuff, right? So they start learning about what is kind of stereotypical and what society kind of uh, uh, expects from them doesn't mean it's right you know it's okay for girls to play with trucks too and it's okay for boys to play with dolls and by the way boys do play with dolls it's just that we don't call them dolls we call them action figures it's the same thing okay 
It's just that we start teaching our kids these stereotypes early on, right? That's a doll, you don't play with that. Oh, but you can play with your action figure over here. It's the same thing, okay? Um, but they start, um, by age four, they start getting an idea of these basically, uh, of these stereotypes. They don't know that they're called stereotypes, but they start behaving as if this is okay for boys and this is okay for girls. They're becoming stereotypical. Uh, sex differences, okay, so here's the thing. Uh, there are biological differences between males and females. Uh, boys do, uh, males in general, do have higher levels of testosterone and will therefore be more assertive, more aggressive, more antisocial, right? Girls have less of that and will have show less of those behaviors, right? You know, there's differences, you know, in females, there's differences, of course, their organs, their sex organs, and that have to do with hormones as well, right? Hormones affect development of the organs, you know, certain organs, especially the sex organs. We'll talk about that later when we talk about, when we get to adolescence, we talk about that kind of development. Um, body shape is, uh, is a, a, you know, a bit different as they, as, especially as they get older, okay, with males, uh, you know, um, just looking a little bit, this is more true for adolescents. We'll talk about that later, that there are actual sex differences between boys and girls, physically, hormonally, biologically, even brain differences. There are some slight different, there are some differences. Uh, gender differences uh, have to do with roles and behaviors, uh, not so much biological stuff. When we talk about sex differences, right, um, that's, that has more to do with biology, okay, like biological sex, but gender differences are more psychological, okay. Um, gender differences uh, in roles, behaviors uh, are prescribed by culture for males and females. So you learn about those things because of your culture. At first, uh, children may be confused about gender and sex. And a lot of people are actually and see those things as the same thing. Uh, they are not. Okay. But at first, children might not may be confused about that. It doesn't mean that they won't be, you know, stereotypically male or female uh, down the road. They could be in the middle, by the way. But by age five, there's an increased awareness of sex, right? I'm a boy, I, I should act this way, or I'm a girl, I should act this way. Those gender differences, right, about what's appropriate for boys and girls. By age eight, there's the belief that biological sex is a permanent trait, okay? That it's just the way you were born and you can't do anything about being a boy or a girl, it's just the way you are, okay? They realize that by age eight, okay? Uh, your sex, by the way, is biological. You can't really do much about that. There are things you can do, you wanna change that, but, uh, but for, for the most part, it's, it's your biological sex, it's, bio, it's biological, you don't really affect that. Um, from ages two to eight, so there's an increased awareness of sex differences, there's preferences for same-sex playments as they get older, uh, and more stereotypical gender activities. Okay, where do these uh, ideas about gender come from? Uh, why are boys more a certain way and girls a certain way? Where, where does this come from, okay? The development of gender, okay, we're gonna talk about that. Uh, Freud, uh, his explanation had to do with the phallic stage, okay? Remember the phallic stage? I think we talked about that already. Um, where This is the stage where children become aware of their genitals. They become aware that, uh, you know, they have something down there. And according to, it says playing, but according to Freud, they start playing with their genitals. They're, you know, they basically touch them and it feels kind of funny to them. And according to Freud, they become attracted to the opposite sex parent. Boys develop the Oedipus complex and basically, um, you know, they, uh, they become attracted to their mothers and according to Freud, it's a sexual attraction and become hostile toward their fathers because dad is the one that gets to be with mom and they develop castration anxiety. They're afraid that dad's gonna find out that they wanna be with mommy sexually and the dad's gonna retaliate by cutting off their tes testicles. I know that sounds crazy, but that's the Oedipus complex. Girls develop the Electro complex, according to Freud, that where they become sexually attracted to their fathers and wanna get rid of mommy um, and they develop penis envy because uh, according to Freud, they notice that they don't have a penis and they think there's something wrong with them because they lack a penis. The complex is resolved through, through identification. Girls learn that they are girls and they should spend more time with mommy and other girls and they learn about what being girls are like. Boys learn that they are boys and they need to be, spend more time with boys and they learn about what boys are like, right? Um, so they learn appropriate gender role behavior by identifying with the same sex parent according to, um, according to Freud. It started out that they were sexually attracted to the opposite sex parent, but you kind of gently nudge them away and, and basically, you know, make them go, you know, make them be with the same sex. So mommy says to the boy, stop spending so much time with mommy, you're a boy, go hang out with dad. 
And dad says to the girl, you're a girl, go hang out with mommy and other girls, right? Dad has boy things to do, dad things to do, okay? So they identify with the same sex parent at the end of the stage and they learn appropriate, you know, gender role behavior. What, you know, boys learn appropriate boy behavior and girls learn so-called appropriate girl behavior, okay? Um, here's some, uh, you might think that Freud is just insane, right? And talking about these things, it doesn't make any sense. How could he say those things that boys are sexually attracted to their fathers? I mean, the boys sexually attracted to their mothers and girls to their fathers, right? Uh, that sounds kind of crazy. I will tell you that there are, there is some anecdotal evidence for this, okay? Um, here's a, a note that a little girl left on her mommy's, uh, actually, here's, here's a, a conversation between a little girl and her mother. Bethany's the four-year-old, and then she's talking to her mother. Bethany says, when I grow up, I'm going to marry daddy. And mother says, but daddy's married to me, right? You can't marry daddy, right? And Bethany says, that's all right. When I'll grow up, you'll probably be dead. I know that sounds kind of mean and funny, but that's what she said. The mother says, but daddy's older. He'll probably be dead too, right? The mother knows what the little girl's doing here, and she's, she's not being too mean or strict. She's kind of playing along here. And uh, Bethany says, that's okay. I'll marry him when he gets born again. Mother doesn't really know where she got this idea of being born again, right? Of reincarnation, something like that. But this is the, not atypical, by the way. You might find little boys and little girls will tell you these kind of things, right? Little girls will say that when they're older, they want to marry their daddies. And little boys will say that they want to marry mommy when they're older. They'll say things like that. It's not uncommon. You have to correct them and say, no, no, no. Mommy's married to daddy. You can't have daddy. You can't have mommy. And you gently nudge them away. And by the way, they will also get sad. They might even start to cry when you tell them this kind of stuff, when you tell them that they can't marry daddy, they can't marry mommy. I told that to my little girl and she started to cry. I told her, oh, when you grow up, you'll find somebody who's right for you, right? No, it can't be daddy, okay? But they will express things like this. And according to Freud, this is all evidence of the Oedipus and Electra complex, depending on whether you have a boy or a girl. And here's a note that a little girl left on her daddy's pillow. That's also some anecdotal evidence here of the Electra complex. It says, to pop, dump mom and have me. I love you. Okay, she left this note on her daddy's pillow. She's obviously expressing a desire to be with her daddy, but she's saying that daddy should dump mommy and be with her instead, right? Freud would say, this is evidence of the Electra complex. The girl is basically expressing a sexual desire for her father and wants to get rid of mommy, okay? Um, it doesn't have to be that way. Other psychologists, other people would say that, no, this doesn't really say that. This girl obviously loves her daddy and she wants to be with her daddy and it's just an innocent attraction. There's nothing sexual here at all. There's no evidence of anything sexual here. Freud believed it was sexual. And it's not just girls, by the way, you know, it's also boys. Like I said, boys will also say that they want to marry their mommies and boys will also say things like mommy's their girlfriend or things like that when they learn about those things about getting married and having a girlfriend or something like that. When they're little, by the way, this is ages three to six, keep in mind, okay? Uh, they'll say things like this and might even get mad at daddy when daddy hugs mommy or kiss, kisses mommy. They might even get jealous. You'll see these kind of things in your own kids. And it's normal. It happens. Freud says it's evidence for his theory. It doesn't necessarily have to be sexual, right? It's, they're not necessarily thinking those things according to other people. But you have to gently nudge them away and say, hey, you're a girl. Go play with girls, right? Hey, you're a boy. Go hang out with daddy. And then that's identification that helps them learn about what being a boy is like, what being a girl is like. The stereotypical things according to our culture, which is not necessarily healthy, by the way, um, according to other theorists. More about gender development. There's biological explanations of gender development. Obviously, biology matters, right? And boys and girls are different biologically. There are some slight differences. There are differences in uh, the chromosomes. Remember that, you know, when it comes to the sex chromosome, Females are XX and boys are XY. That Y chromosome, what it basically does is turn what would otherwise be a girl into a boy. That's what the Y chromosome does, okay? That will affect uh, level hormonal differences. So the Y chromosome basically causes testosterone uh, to rise in males, okay? And, and that testosterone and those male hormones will affect the development of the brain as well. 
which will lead to boys being more dominant, more aggressive. Their brains are different, okay? They have higher levels of testosterone than, than, uh, than girls in general, okay? Much higher levels. And they'll get much higher levels, by the way, at puberty. They'll rise even more. And then you'll see some big differences, okay, in behavior. Um, sex hormones also affect brain development, like I told you, right? Uh, they do. There are some slight differences between the males of uh, the brains of males and females that relate to sex, that relate to uh, to gender, that relate to uh, the differences that we see. Females also have a larger corpus callosum, right? This is a very important brain difference. This may give uh, you know females an advantage when it comes to communication and language. Females are better at that stuff. Okay, and it may be because they have a larger corpus callosum that allows the two brain, halves of the brain to communicate more effectively with one another. Epigenetic uh, theory says that genes interact with experience. It's not just genetic things that cause biological differences, which then affect uh, experience and you know, behavior, but also experience and behavior will also affect biology. Okay, so girls are genetically inclined to talk sooner, for instance, uh, but with lots of social interaction, uh, they will also develop verbal skills superior to boys. So it's not just the biological stuff, but it's also the environmental stuff. Both of those things are acting on the behavior, okay? They are affecting each other, okay? Biology affects, you know, behavior and tendencies that we see in the environment, but the environment will also affect behavior and can also affect biology itself, you know, through nutrition and through, uh, you know, other things. Okay, that we already talked about, but here we're talking about gender. Okay, nutrition doesn't really affect gender, but you know, but just to make the point about epigenetic theory, what it says that the basically the interaction is is uh, goes both ways. Okay, gender development, social explanations. A lot of people nowadays believe more in the social explanations for gender development, and not so much the uh, Freudian explanations that a lot of people considered outdated and invalid. Okay. Biological differences, they're there. You can't really argue against them. There's a lot of research showing that, but there's also social explanation. People say that uh, we reinforce appropriate boy and girl behavior, that we basically reward boys for being more assertive, more aggressive, for playing with certain things, and we punish them for acting like girls. We punish boys for playing with dolls, okay? And that girls, we punish them for playing with toys that are more stereotypically uh, for boys, okay? And we punish for girls for being mean and being aggressive, and instead we reward them for being, uh, you know, nicer and be more communicative, okay? Males learn, for instance, that boys don't cry, right? Boys are tough, they don't cry, okay? Girls learn that, you know, uh, girls need to be nice and act like a lady and care about others, okay? How are boys, you know, how are boys and girls treated that express this, right? There's many different examples. And if this were live, uh, it is live, but I mean, if this was in face-to-face -face in class and I wasn't recording this, we can discuss these things. But yes, we do these things. We teach them about, about appropriate boy and girl behavior through our own behavior by modeling, but we also punish and reward children you know, directly for certain behaviors that are stereotypical. Modeling, I mentioned model, I just mentioned modeling, yes. What males and females learn from their parents, right? The way parents behave, from their peers, from other boys, other girls, right? From the media, on TV, right? On the internet, you see very stereotypical behavior about how boys behave and how girls behave. And we also learn in that way, this uh, appropriate boy-girl uh, behavior, this stereotypical behavior that leads to our uh, development about our gender, the way we, uh, we express ourselves, uh, you know, in terms of being masculine or feminine. Cognitive theory says that it basically has to do with the mind and uh, the way the, the mind organizes information. Cognitive theory, uh, that it's basically all about categorization. That the brain basically, uh, the mind, if you want to call it that, basically uh, organizes information, okay? And when you organize information, you put things into categories. And then these categories, uh, that difference between them is exaggerated. Uh, and that leads to kind of stereotypical behavior uh, about boys and girls. So as we learn about male and female characteristics, we form categories, okay? Our mind likes to break things up into categories, into groups, 
right? And then we use these to guide our further thinking. Oh, you're a girl, therefore you act this way and you are probably this way, right? And we tend to stereotype. Oh, you're a boy, you're probably gonna be more aggressive and you're gonna be more this way, right? We develop these gender schemas, which are basically stereotypes about what's, you know, what's masculine, what's feminine, what's appropriate for boys, what's appropriate for girls. This is just about how the mind works, how learning works, how memory works. That's what this theory says. It's just the way the brain organizes information. It likes to put things into categories, makes distinctions among those categories, and then basically we use that information to guide behavior and to guide our thinking, which leads to this very stereotypical thinking. Gender stereotyping, of course, is the belief that our general uh, belief about gender characteristics of males and females, that females are this way and males are this way. That's gender stereotyping, and this is this results from categorization. It's just the way the brain works, according to this theory. There are very harmful effects of gender stereotyping. Yes, there are, right? Uh, it's harmful, for instance, uh, for you to tell your boys, for instance, or to you raise your boys believing that they shouldn't show their feelings, that they shouldn't cry, right? That that's not appropriate for boys. But we teach them that indirectly. You know, stop being such a wuss, stop being such a baby, stop crying, right? You're teaching boys that they need to repress their feelings, that they shouldn't show their feelings. And you teach girls the opposite, that girls shouldn't stand up for themselves, that they need to be nice and communicate, and you shouldn't be aggressive, right? It's very harmful, like these stereotypes can be very harmful. And there's a lot of maladjusted people out there, children and especially adults, who are very maladjusted and don't know how to behave themselves, don't know how to get along with others, because they're very stereotypical in their thinking, okay? They're very, uh, I should say, uh, they're very stereotypical. I'm forgetting the word, very chauvinistic, okay? Uh, very macho in their sort of thinking. It's very unhealthy, by the way, as a, as a child and especially as an adult. And this is just starting as you, when you're a child, but especially as an adult, for you to behave as a, as, as a man, for instance, a very macho way, very... Uh, aggressive and overly assertive and believe that just that females want a man to rule over them and tell them what to do and basically force your will upon them. That is very bad to have that kind of thinking. But that, that is that old fashioned, very macho way of thinking that still exists. It's very common. Okay. And it is very harmful for women to believe that they can't stand up for themselves. They can't be aggressive and assertive and they just need to take this basically uh, macho kind of behavior or that they need to basically, uh, or that they just need to put up with the discrimination and the problems that there are in the world where women are treated worse, okay? It's very harmful, right? This gender stereotyping, but this theory says that it's just the way, it's a product of the way we think. Freud says it's a product of basically the Oedipus and Electro complex. Bio biology says it's a product of basically hormones, biology, genetics, okay? So we have different explanations. Uh, and I guess that's the last slide. Okay, so I will um, stop recording.